Welcome to the Organ Podcast from the Royal College of Organists with me, Mark O'Brien. Coming up, I talk to the new Director of Music at Sheffield Cathedral, Tom Daggett, about the work he's doing to rebuild the choral foundation there. And I find out how blind organist David Liddell learns organ music through Braille, and who was lucky enough to rub shoulders with some of the greatest French organists of the 20th century. But first... What you're listening to now is organist Darius Batiwala improvising to an old silent movie in front of an audience at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. They're watching a 1920s German horror film called The Cabinet of Dr Caligari, which is being projected onto a huge screen hanging in front of the organ. I have to say, it's a somewhat bizarre film about a mad hypnotist who uses a sleepwalker to commit a load of murders. And I suspect, like much of the audience here, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But right now, we're watching the sleepwalker creeping along a dark and twisting corridor towards a young damsel asleep in her bed. He's approaching her bed, raising a dagger and she awakes and screams he grabs her as she tries to break free there's now an almighty struggle as she attempts to fight him off but to no avail She's fainted. And he's now carrying her out of the room. Well, to find out what happens next, you'll have to watch the film. But earlier, I met up with Darius at the organ console to find out how he prepares for an improvisation like this. Most of the preparation is just watching the film. Uh, you really need to know how long each scene's going to last. You need not to have any surprises. The audience can be surprised, but, but you can't be, because sometimes you have to anticipate certain events. So do you have a list in advance, like light motif? so here's the heroine or here's the villain, I'm going to use this stop or yeah, this uh, melody? To an extent. I mean, I, 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 I don't worry too much if I end up not doing that, or if it works out slightly differently, because things always work out slightly differently. And sometimes things go not quite as well as you planned, but then sometimes you have an inspired idea that you didn't think of when you were doing the preparation and you can just go with that and if you come back and do the same film again you can think oh yeah I did that last time and that seemed to work well but yes there there are particular registrations or or harmonies or or textures for for different characters yes can you give me an idea I mean the film tonight it's an odd film really isn't it It, well yes it is odd it's expressionist so it's deliberately unreal is, is the main thing you know the sets are unrealistic deliberately even the acting style is deliberately unrealistic and the main character is Dr Caligari himself he has a sort of sleepwalker that he takes around in a box who commits crimes on his behalf so Caligari is a sort of evil evil genius so for that I'm using something quite um, reedy and a, a motif that sort of it goes between C major to F sharp to F sharp minor because it's a technically thing that's easy to do sort of And that's developed and, and resolved. But that's his basic motif. In one element, you've got to anticipate the big climax point. So yes. if, you know, there's an explosion or a crash, you've got to be there with a the cadence. You have. But what about when it's sort of mundane stuff, you know, like a man sitting down in a chair well, reading then, a book? Yeah, sometimes the music is just there for filling in. It's just there so there isn't silence. Uh, and that's fine because you can't be operating at sort of high voltage maximum intensity all the time. The, the audience needs to have points to relax. And if you are doing the relaxing thing you know, the relaxing can still be in the harmonic style that you've established for that particular bit. I mean, for the somnambulist... um, That's the sleepwalker, The sleepwalker, yes, who who sort of is manipulated into doing these murders. I've got... There's a sort of slightly tonally 
ambiguous sort of major minor thing, which I suppose is maybe a bit Shostakovich y, which is. So this is the sleepwalker? Yes, some, something like. So you've got that major and minor thing going on. We're here at the Royal Northern College of Music's organ, so what, it is a, a neoclassical, you describe it? Is. It is, it's not exactly what you'd probably think of when Three you're... Three manual, 50-odd yes. stops. But like all organs, it can be a constant wall of sound. It can, So for yes. a one-hour, 20-minute film, do you employ silence? Do you suddenly change to sound effects? How do you give that breath for the audience so you, it's you not to, overwhelming? Yes. I mean, I, you have to, to be careful not to have too full a texture all the time. So sometimes you'll have occasionally single lines or bits where you don't use the pedal. You don't very often use silence. It can be effective uh, occasionally, but then there's always the danger that somebody will cough or drop their phone or something. Mm. But yes, you're right, it does have to be varied. But one advantage of doing silent films is that you can use effects on the organ that you wouldn't ever use in repertoire mm. or use stops in unusual registers or in different ways. So we're talking sound effects. I mean, this uh, is not well, melodic sound... or are you actually not... trying to imitate a train no, or not, a gun not, not or not trying something. to imitate necessarily, but maybe something that's a bit dreamlike or hallucinatory. Um, one thing that you can do on an organ like this that has a lot of mutation stops, you can build up a sort of... If you start playing that in more than single notes, you get a quite a weird sort of... And then that takes one or two hands, and while you're doing that, other things can be sort of punctuating it. You can do things with the swell box, you know, the ab abrupt crescendos, diminuendos, clusters of notes. There's lots of, there's lots of things you can do, but there's a balance because if you, if you try and illustrate everything, it sets up an unrealistic expectation of, in the audience that everything's going to be illustrated. On the other hand, there are some things that happen that, that have to be acknowledged, you know, so it doesn't happen in this film, but there's a particular film where a bell that rings, the camera goes to a close-up of a bell that starts to ring. So you, you can't make an exact bell noise, but you can't ignore it either. So you want to do something like... Just so you've got that alarm sound, which, which the bell is drawing attention to. And when you're actually improvising, I mean, is it just a longer version of perhaps a liturgical improvisation? Or are you really doing or using very different musical skills for this? Well, a bit of both, I suppose. In one way, it's very different because you really have to be in the film. You can't just decide, oh... I'm going to make it a bit louder here, you know, the, the bishop's a bit late, I'm going to have to extend this a bit, you know, you're, you're, you're really bound by that by the film. And I think when you improvise in church, you often are in that open-ended situation where you're waiting for something to happen, like, you know, the bride's late or something, or you have to improvise in a structured way. So in that way, it's different. It's also different because different harmonic styles are, are appropriate. I mean, I, I tend to go for a sort of post-romantic style that would have been around in the 1920s, uh, which you maybe wouldn't use so much in cathedral improvisation, though you could do. So, no, I, th I, th I think on balance it, it's quite different, but having that general, you know, harmonic adaptability is important in, in both, I think. But interesting what you've demonstrated so far. It, it is more effect atmosphere. I mean, are there very explicit melodies that you would employ? Uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... Here's one I've used for Phantom of the Opera, which, again, has a bit more... Because it's, it isn't a slightly weird, deliberately unreal thing that this is, it, it makes more of an emotional impact. So something like... Um quite expansive, I think, with something like that. How did you get into this? Well, I've always been interested in improvisation. Um, I was a finalist one year at the St Albans Improvisation Competition, uh, and a friend of mine who knew I liked improvising had an organ at school that was being reopened, so he said, why don't you come and improvise for Phantom of the Opera? And that was in 2008, and I've been doing it fairly regularly, on organ and piano, actually, ever since. And are there many people doing this? Um, not loads, probably not more than you could count on the fingers of of one hand, or maybe two at the most. 
And what's the audience reaction? What do you find? Are people coming because it's an old film or they're coming for an organ concert? How does it work? It, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, some of the films, I mean, like Dr Caligari and like Nosferatu, have got quite a cult following among film enthusiasts. So you'll get that audience. And it's a brilliant way of getting people to hear the organ because you get people that wouldn't normally come to organ recitals. So you tend to get bigger audiences for these than you get for normal organ recitals. And it's a good way of of introducing to them to to magnificent instruments and maybe hearing it in a different way. And for you then, as an organist, do you, because you regularly, you're playing at Leeds Town Hall, is this more fun doing it this way? Or is it just a a different string to your bow, to use the wrong metaphor? Well, (laughs) it's huge fun. I mean, I really enjoy it. And I think think it's just different. I mean, obviously, it doesn't need the amount of actual practising the notes, but it still needs that amount of preparation, just learning what's going to happen next in the film, especially when a film's got a bit of a complicated narrative or maybe intercutting between different events that are happening simultaneously. That really needs concentrating to keep on top of that. And if you do comedies, because although there isn't the thing with the light motifs and uh, all the different harmonic styles, you've just got to play a lot of high energy fast music for a long time. And that in itself is, is not that easy. So the comedies are actually harder work in a way. Physically demanding for that amount of time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it is definitely. I think the longest film I've done was three hours, but I did get an, I did get an interval in the middle of that. <laughs> but you clearly love this. This is really oh, yeah, fun. It's, it, it's, it, it's hugely uh, rewarding, actually. It's great fun to do. In 2020, the then Dean and Chapter of Sheffield Cathedral sparked controversy by disbanding the choir. The aim being to make a fresh start with a renewed ambition for engagement and inclusion. Well, since then, there's been a new Dean and Chapter and a new Director of Music, Tom Daggett, who for nine years worked at St Paul's Cathedral in London, pioneering a very successful music and choral programme for thousands of children across the city. Well, he's now bringing that experience to Sheffield with the task of rebuilding the cathedral's choral foundation, working in partnership with the National School's singing programme. I spoke to Tom at Sheffield Cathedral about the work that he's doing. You're in a very unique position where you've got to create a cathedral choir, from scratch. Yes, I suppose so. Although there have been um, a choir of choral scholars and professional singers in the interregnum led by Ian Seddon, I think what I've inherited, if anything, is a range of people with a range of emotions about music here. So although there is the opportunity to rebuild uh, what was here in terms of choral excellence uh, and access to education for children and thinking about the organ programme and recordings and broadcasts, all that kind of stuff. Actually, there is there is a very complex web of ideas around what music is or should and can be here. So I'm very keen to listen to friends and colleagues around that and to act carefully. But there is a lot of new growth here too. So I'd like to acknowledge the hurt of the past firstly, and say that that is not something I take lightly, but also to say that there are signs of new life too in the the new school partnerships that we have across the diocese, the many thousands of children we will be working with in the coming years. But yeah, there's, there's definitely the sense of having something of a blank canvas in terms of the scope of what we're able to rebuild but I, I will always refer back to what has been because I don't think you just invent traditions. I think they rely on institutional memory. They rely on people's experience of the building of the place. Um, Sheffield Cathedral, any cathedral has a sound, it has a people. Um, so I'm very alive and attuned to that. 
But there is the, the simple reality that you need young choristers to turn up on a Sunday and for midweek services on a regular basis. How are you going to do this? What are you doing when you go into schools, when you meet these children? What do you do to inspire them to consider this type of existence? So what I do in the classroom is try to build bridges between what they would find here in the cathedral and what their experience of music in school is, which means that the, the theoretical jump between singing as part of your Year 5 class and joining a cathedral choir is minimised. The mistake, if there has been one sometimes that I've seen in certain places, is that there might be difficulties with recruitment, but you look at what's being delivered in school and actually it's a far cry from what a chorister would be doing uh, behind the choir stalls. So what I'm keen to do is to, is to create a, a curriculum, if you like, to deliver in schools, which is done with very high standards, with good technical awareness, with a breadth of repertoire. You know, th this is all the stuff which characterises our cathedral choirs, and that is what I want to take into the classrooms, which, as I say, intellectually bridges the gap, perhaps, between what is delivered in education work, as we might call it, uh, and the front row of a cathedral choir. But where do you get that musical appeal for the children? What is that bridge you're taking to school? Because this is church music we're talking about. There are many programmes that encourage children to sing, there are breathing classes and so forth. But you are, as you've just said, wanting to encourage them to come into a cathedral. So musically, what do you do? We go in there with hymns, uh, with pieces in Latin. It might be Christus Factus Est before, you know, to pick out an example uh, the, towards the end of this term. It might be for year six, Pergolesi Stabat Mater. Uh, it might be a folk song. It might be O Danny Boy. It might be something, it might be a Polynesian boat song in call and response if you're in year two. So although it's grounded in the music of the church, it's, it's more colourful. We do take canticles and hymns and anthems and Latin um, and other languages too. But I would say teaching in a very deliberate, patient and slow way while um, sort of balancing a raising of standards from what they might have received in school to date, which might be a music session delivered on a whiteboard where a teacher presses play with a little bit of encouragement from a non-specialist classroom teacher. That is the reality for lots of schools. And what we're able to do is remove the wool from the eyes of teachers in seeing the musical capabilities, even things like pitch, because most songs which um, schools do, I think, are pitched too low. The songs that we have in the repertoire of the cathedral tradition are historically pitched at a place where the head voice is animated very naturally. So this afternoon, these year six children confidently were singing high top Bs, which you don't tend to find in primary schools. So there's not too much of a rift between what they might come and hear in the cathedral choir to what they're receiving in the classroom. Um, so what you're doing is you're not dumbing down. You're not trying to bring music that meets the children where they are. You're taking those children and dragging them to where you think they should be in order to appreciate yeah. something of greater richness. Yeah, it's not it's not a negotiation exercise for me. So it's not the case that, you know, we sing we sing a bit of Pergolesi and then we'll do some funny songs. I mean, you know, you can get just as much fun from teaching Resonet in Laudibus around Christmas as you can from, you know, the crazy frog, frankly. <laughs> Um, and again, this is what I mean in the way, the way that it's delivered and the way that it's taught. So, I, you know, I wouldn't be having children sitting and I wouldn't be instructing them. I would invite movement and we, maybe we'd be stomping the beats or we'd be clicking the rhythm or we'd be, you know, air conducting while we're singing. And these are the things that I think the children will take away. You know, it's, it's, it's by subterfuge in a way um, getting music theory in while teaching good music, which um, allows them to sing it well. But from your point of view, the real proof of the pudding is to instill that sense of commitment and desire to come and do this regularly in a church, in a cathedral setting. How are you going about doing that? Yeah, I think it, 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 the first priority to us, actually, is delivering high-quality music education for as many schools as possible, which are the least resourced. That is my primary focus in leading this department. My primary focus isn't to build, you know, a world-leading cathedral choir. It is, it is certainly on my agenda, but my primary job 
is to deliver something which is um, about equity in the world of music education. It's about justice. It's about rebalancing where our state schools in Sheffield are. The church, I believe, is in a position to speak very strongly into a very broad range of children, equipping them with lifelong skills, supporting classroom teachers, supporting the ethos of our church schools when they are church schools. And the byproduct of that is that over time we develop relationships with the individual children and their families. And that is when the keenest children will be encouraged to join the cathedral choir. And I really believe that that is how we will be recruiting choristers in this place for generations to come. It's through lived experience in school. Children see something that they value. They see something that they want to take part of, that they think is of of worth, and they will get involved. But this is a real long-term investment for you then. This isn't some short-term, we'll have some initiatives and, you know, hopefully by next Michaelmas we'll have a front row line of 12 trebles. This is really years you're investing in, if not generation. Absolutely. I mean, I'm in it for the long haul. I think there is room for proactive growth while affecting long-term cultural change. So what I haven't been comfortable with is the idea that we have no children singing here at all. So we do have 10 children who are part of our Little Lights Choir who sing every Sunday morning at the start of the service. So I've taken some early action on that. And simply, they meet for an hour before the service and learn a song. Uh, With no music, the parents can go and have a coffee in the coffee shop. So we've thought about how to minimise the disruption to family lives. The parents can still be around. They don't have to get back to the house and then come back in. You know, we've changed the hours, opening hours of our coffee shop to allow for that. So I think that there are some quick wins for me. But the long-term cultural change is a diocesan thing. It involves the um, Board of Education. It involves high-level fundraising. It involves staffing and resourcing and encouraging people to come to work in a cathedral like ours, whereas they might go and perhaps be a secondary school music teacher or perhaps they might be a full-time performer. So there's a degree of persuasion which is attached to this work, I think. That is the stuff that's quite long-term. So what's your vision, your ultimate vision for the sound the Sheffield sound that you can create. You're lucky because, in in one respect, you do have a blank canvas. You talk about tradition. And I also think back to the the controversy of the previous dean and chapter when they did disband the Mm. choir. And one of the reasons was to have something that is future-proof, something that is looking forward to represent Sheffield as it is today. Is that what you have in mind? I mean, I I don't have any particular problem with that goal, as was articulated. Of course, the the way in which um, this was delivered is when that started to unravel, perhaps. But actually, the vision to have something which is representative is absolutely what I think we ought to be doing. In terms of choristers, there are 84,000 children in Sheffield. That's a huge range of it's a big um, front row it's a very big front row <laughs> so i think that what what my vision is if i have one is that we should get every child in sheffield singing every day of their school lives that that is something which i'd like to challenge myself to achieve with colleagues it's something i've shared with the music hub and with other arts organizations and i think that should be a pillar for us therefore What we are able to contribute as a cathedral should be authentically ours. I have no problem whatsoever in flying the flag for the traditional cathedral choir in terms of its repertoire, in terms of its teaching practices and approaches. I think the edges of that cathedral choir can be very soft and make room for artistic collaboration. I think our building here should be filled with folk music, with brass band music, from music from different ethnic backgrounds, it, with different languages and different instruments. I have no nervousness around generosity in that regard, but I'm quite clear that what lies at the heart of our musical foundation will be something very authentic to where the choral tradition has been. And in doing so, I think this is how we reinvent that tradition 
for for new generations. We don't batten down the hatches and pretend that no other music exists. We explore how our tradition, such as we've inherited it, can adapt and change and grow as a result. Tom Daggett, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This is Spring Song by Alfred Hollins, and it's being played by David Abrahamian Liddell at the Church of St Michael's Cornhill in London. David, like Alfred Hollins, is a blind organist and composer, and follows in a long tradition of blind organists such as Louis Vierne, Jean Langlais, Gaston Littes, Helmut Valka, André Marshall, and even Louis Braille himself, who was a blind organist. Well, I met David Little at his home in London, and I began by asking him how easy it was for him to start reading music through Braille. To begin with, I did rather tend to ignore any signs I didn't understand, which sometimes had quite serious results. What, you're just playing completely wrong notes and in the wrong order? Yes, or in the wrong octave or whatever. (laughs) But you you learn by your mistakes, because then you listen to a record and you think, oh, I didn't know about those notes. And you go back to the braille and you think, ah, so that's what that sign must mean. So there was a lot of deduction and gradually catching up. Well, how do you do it? Because we're in your house in Muswell Hill and we're standing in front of the organ that that you play on. You've got some braille manuscript. Can you explain how you learn music through braille? Let me indicate to you what a braille cell is. So we've got six dots and that is a full braille cell. There are no more than six dots in any Braille character. So, for example, an A is just the top left-hand dot. A B, this is alphabetical, A and B. B happens to be the top left-hand dot and then the middle left-hand dot. So that's Mm -hmm. dots one and two. So a C would be all three dots in a straight line on the left-hand side. No, that's an L. (laughs) (laughs) I thought Uh, I was getting it then. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, it's not quite that logical. And the worst thing is that Braille literature, C, is one thing, but the music C is the alphabetical D. For some reason, the alphabetical letters D, E, F, G, H, I, J are the same in Braille for the musical letters C, D, E, F, G, A, B. So you really have to forget everything you've learned. Yes, you have to unlearn it and relearn it to something else. In order to play a piece of music. That's all because there are only six dots. That's all you can make anything from, whether it's English, French, German, music or mathematics or science. So all these signs are reused for different things. I mean, I mean, I naively thought that perhaps Braille would be the raised equivalent of what we would see on the music. But in Braille, there are no staves, no. there are no notes. And by what you're saying, you've got to read each note individually. Is that right? Yes. I mean, for example, here, this is um, the Toccata Chorale and Fugue by Francis Jackson, which um, in I, Braille. he's actually signed to me. I'm not quite sure... Where? And it's brown, empty, it's sheets of empty brown paper, and I can just <laughs> see very faintly the raised imprints of, of well, the Braille Well, to dots. me, em- the idea of it being em- <laughs> empty is absurd, but um, obviously it looks empty to you. Yeah. I did once find myself on a train um, coming home for a weekend from school, and there was a little girl with her parents in the same compartment, and I heard her whispering to her mum, Mummy, why is that man reading wallpaper? <laughs> You, you've got mm. the book open and it looks like the, the middle of, of the work. Your left yes, hand right. is searching for something going left to right on the left page. Yes. What are you actually reading right now? Well, at the top it says 13, which is the page number. Then it says chorale, so we're in the middle movement. Uh, and then it says great, colon, flute, comma, or stop diapason, brackets, swell, and choir. Then underneath the registration it says larghetto, And then it says crotchet equals 63, and then five sharps, 4-4. Now, at this point, your hand is a quarter of the way down the page. Braille is bulky. It takes up a lot of space. That is the trouble with it. 
I've got to remember that it's in five sharps because you can only really, really read one thing at a time in Braille. So as soon as I take my hand off the key signature, it's got to be in my memory. So this says right hand, swell, MP, open a phrase, and finally we get to some notes, F, which is sharp, dotted crotchet, dotted quaver, I mean, then G sharp, semi-quaver. Um, okay, and then the next bar up to F, dotted minim, E, dotted quaver, and then D sharp, uh, semi-quaver. But then there's an in accord with sign, which means that in the same bar of right hand, We've also, in another part, another voice, we've got a B semibrief. So we've we've got the top part which says but underneath we've got so it's So hang on a minute. You are having to learn you're 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 not getting the whole bar at once. You're having to learn each voice, as it were. Yes. And then you've got to realise that the next bit you read are the parts that happen to go underneath the voice part you've just learnt. Yes. And would this be, if we went back in time and you were Louis Vierne, is this what he would be doing as well? Yes, absolutely. It's exactly the same no tradition. Change. And am I right in thinking you have some of Vierne's, his own Braille scores? I've got one, which is right here. Oh my goodness. So this is the Sixth Symphony, and it's it's done in the typical French paragraph method, which is different from what I showed you in the Francis yes, Jackson. the pages here are, are very are much smaller. It's half the size of the yes. book you had a second ago. But he he regained some sight from all the many operations he had, most of, mostly in Switzerland. So it's difficult to know whether he actually would have used this copy mark, but it was in his library. But as a young man, he certainly used Braille at the School for the Blind in Paris, mm. which I know because I stayed there. And that's where César Franck used to come and adjudicate at their music competitions you're you're reading with your left hand but when you're yeah. actually learning the left hand you can't read with your right hand can well you, unfortunately i'm hopeless at reading with my right hand other people are much more ambidextrous than i am and, and would would be able to do that but no so there's a sort of transferring that has to happen that when i'm learning the left hand part so i initially i would play the left hand part <laughs> with my right hand, play that as many times as I need to get it in my memory, and then play it with the left hand. And how long does it take you actually to master a piece? Well, I've pushed myself very hard over the years. I, I, I deliberately didn't want to finish Vidor's Eighth Symphony uh, in Ari because I felt that after that there was nothing greater. So I took nine years to learn that. Nine Mo years? Yeah, movement at a time, because I... Almost, I didn't really want to get to the end of it. Now, when you say nine years, I mean, are you, you know, there are gaps in between oh, movements yes. where you do other things, oh, or yes, is it yes. so complex that on, you know, three hours a day for nine years, no. you get a Vidor symphony? No, no, it was very much gaps, um, doing other things, letting a year or two go by and then thinking, OK, well, maybe I'll learn the, the next movement now. So with the Seventh Symphony, I set myself the opposite challenge. I learned the whole Seventh Symphony in a month. So learning it in a month, that's memorising the entire symphony in a month. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's a tall order for anyone. Mm. Are we talking six hours a day, eight hours a day, nothing else but learning that? Um, probably more like four or five hours a day, yeah. I memorised the E minor wedge fugue of Bach in four hours. I think that was my all-time record. I mean, was that from just Braille, without the keyboard, you, you, you put it in your head and then went to the keyboard? No, I, I memorised it here at this organ. But four hours? In four hours, yes. I also memorised the Roipka Sonata in a week. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I could do that, but in a sense, it's only the input and, and what matters is the output. I don't get too worried over uh, how long it takes somebody to learn something. What matters is the way they play it. Now, it's interesting. While we're talking, we're actually we're standing up behind the bench and, and yet you lean forward and, and you kind of get the right note straight away. When you are doing your recitals, you're, you've done, what, 16 or so tours around the States. Mm. You've played widely in, in Europe and, of course, in this country. How do you acclimatise and navigate a new organ? I um, 
insist on having a, a, a decent time on the organ beforehand, I mean, at least the day before. I thought I, maybe I was asking for a lot, but then I remember Jennifer Bate telling me uh, that, that she would insist on several days before a, a recital, so that actually m my demands were, were quite modest. I would have somebody with me uh, who would read out the names of the stops, and I would write a sort of chart. I would make my braille specification a sort of map. Things in the middle are the most difficult, the most challenging. So, for example, whether it's finding a stop or finding a piston, if you've got a row of eight pistons and you need to reach for number five or number four, that's the hardest. Have you ever had a... a, a horrific disaster oh many oh, anyway what would what happen what's the first thing <laughs> well general done? 13 in baltimore i remember <laughs> particularly i was at the end of the prelude and fugue on the name van Lamp by du Rufle, and it was all working into quite a, quite a lather and the swell reeds had come on and everything and it was really getting towards the end and i pressed the, fa the n notorious general 13 and everything disappeared leaving me with just an eight foot flute and an oboe and the rest of the piece was just a mad scramble trying to reassemble the registration and, and keep the momentum going. <laughs> it was a total disaster. Are you hard on yourself or do you give yourself an allowance for that kind of thing to happen? Well, I mean, it was it was a real trauma for me at that time. And I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson from experiences like that, which is, you know, to be kind to yourself and be careful where which pistons you register things on um, if you've got to find a, a piston in a, in a real hurry then don't set it on one of those ones in the middle set it on one at either end so that you can jab at it really quickly my specification when i'm brailing out the specification with somebody would always include the positions of the pistons for example on a hill norman and beard organ i would usually find that the divisionals would be on number one would be under middle c number two would be under just about D sharp, number three would be under F, number four under G sharp, number five under B, and number six under sort of C sharp. And so you sort of remember, you sort of memorise the note where you've got to find the piston. So if I had to reach piston number one, two, three, four under, under the G sharp, I would sort of practice in my mind that bar of the music with a G sharp in the middle of it at the precise moment where I had to press the piston. But then, of course, the next night when you're on a different organ, that piston might be elsewhere. Now, I suppose in, in one way, a, a door that opened for you to expose you to so much organ music and, and, and learning the organ was through your friendship with Felix Abrahamian, who was a very famous music critic for the Times and many other things as well. But he opened the door to French organ music and in particular introduced you to your teacher, who was another blind organist, André Marshall. That's correct, yes. Um, of course, I wish that I had been older and Marshall had been younger. But on the other hand, the fact that we were so widely spaced in age meant that I had a contact with a wonderful world of French organ composers that he had known. So when I took my Vienne to him, I was aware that he had known Vienne, been very good friends with Vienne, actually had a piece dedicated to him, and, and Vienne asked him to give the, the first performance of the Fourth Symphony in France. Gosh. And Alain, he'd known Alain very well, and Tournemir as well. And he'd met Faure. I did, didn't Faure congratulate him on his improvising? Apparently, yes, yes. So... Rather wonderful. Of course, Foray suffered from a great deal of hearing loss at the end of his life, so <laughs> one does wonder whether Foray heard anything. To give him the benefit of the doubt. There. We will, yes. But Marshall also taught Longley. You were being taught by someone who taught Longley, Nuvian himself. He was taught by Gigou. Were you aware of that extraordinary legacy that was teaching you the organ? Dimly. He talked about being very proud of being a grand pupil of, of César Franck, because Gigou was a pupil of Franck and Gigou was his teacher. So, yes, that was special, and but it, it, it's it's got more special over the years. You met Longley as well on more than one occasion, is that right? Yes. Was he interested in you at all? No, he was 
he, he didn't sort of reach out to people really he was full of himself he wasn't a very appealing person i met him several times and i always felt as if for him it was the first time in fact the when i met him in cambridge um he did have a, a little bit more of a spark of interest because of my dog i think he was missing his own dog and so he was ever so pleased to see my guide dog which was the the most affectionate that i i i sort of known him really must be quite disappointing really such a legendary figure yes it was i mean he was very unlike marshall who was so delightful and sweet-natured and took an interest and of course somebody you, you you met a few times was olivia messia and he came to the house we're in right now didn't he on, on a few occasions yes felix had been friends with messia since the 1930s i think messia stayed in this house quite a few times did you yes. play to him i did yes he took an age to come down from the organ loft at La Trinité uh, down to street level. And Felix explained to me that Messiaen was a sort of, um, what do they call it, OCD. Mm. And he had to go back and check all the many locked doors between the organ loft and ground, double checking that he'd really locked them. And woe betide him if he thought that he might have left the wind on because then he'd have to undo all those doors and go <laughs> back up and check. But um, when he came here to dinner... Jennifer Bate was here as well, and I just sort of sat in slightly overawed silence next to Messiaen, who was uh, taking a very long time to eat his dinner. We were all ready for our apple pie, but we just had to sit and wait while Messiaen very f fastidiously ate his way through his salmon or whatever it was. So yes, it was um, quite a <laughs> interesting facet of the great man that he took so long to eat everything. But he enjoyed his food. I believe from Felix that Messiaen was considering writing a book about Chinese cookery. He never actually did, but he was obviously very interested in, in food. And and it doesn't really stop there with you, because you, at your time in Cambridge, were very keen on the works of de Rufflet. I don't know whether you met him, but you did end up meeting Madame de Rufflet for a lesson. That's right, yes. I, I would have loved to, to have met de Rufflet, and he was alive and in their flat at the time of my lesson. But, but ever since the road accident that they had in the about 1975, uh, he'd become very morose and sort of angry with the world and not wanting to meet anybody at all. I know in talking to Olivier Latry that he had had the same experience, that he desperately wanted to play and to, uh, or at least meet Du Rufflet, but failed. But Madame was a bit, bit different story. She was absolutely delightful and gave me a lesson at saint Etienne du mont on her husband's works. And I really enjoyed that lesson. You write about that lesson with Madame de Rufflet as, as being one of the most important lessons in your life. Yes, because she was so communicative. She would sing, she would beat time on my leg, she would play on my leg to demonstrate how she wanted notes accented and pressed really hard even though it's the organ she believed in um, adding weight to important notes and less weight to, to less important notes and so that's how she demonstrated it by playing those notes on my knee and uh, she couldn't reach the stops on the opposite side of the console so she had a rolled up newspaper <laughs> my friends thought maybe she was going to whip me at uh, every you. wrong note but uh, in fact she was just using it to get the stops up and down so for somebody who was so fortunate to have been immersed in that French, that Parisian culture, where, of course, improvisation is key, and for a blind organist, do you excel at improvising? Because I assume that must be a great release for you because, you know, you don't have to go through that process. It's a, a liberation for you. Well, you'd think it would be, but no, it's not for me. Uh, I'm not a talented improviser. It's not something I've even really tried to, to foster I do see improvising as the art of padding and waffling and keeping going. As a composer, I'm drawn in the opposite direction. I want to be concise and work things out. So when you're composing, you're not then improvising and bringing that down. You're doing a very methodical ground up approach then. Well, it's all, it's everything. I'm at the keyboard trying things out. I'm at home, maybe just lying on my bed thinking, thinking, thinking. If I can get myself into an in-between sleep and wake stage, that's probably a very fruitful mode to be in for ideas to come. And then I might rush through to the piano and just see if they 
sound as I expect them to. So it, it's everything. Even in my dreams, I've I've worked things out a bit. A great deal of thinking it takes me over the composing. Is there a part of being blind that how you consume this music is very much with inside you? It's actually part of you inside. It's the musical world that is you. I've always felt after a recital, or, or even after a, a, a voluntary at church, that I can be so completely wrung out. People around me don't understand that. They just think, oh, well, he, you know, he played a nice piece there. But I'm so deeply involved in it and give so, so much of myself that I can be totally wrung out, as I say, and just feel drained. People who play long, long recitals, I, do, I, I, can't, I don't know how they do it because I often felt that uh, a full evening recital was almost pushing me beyond my limits. But well, you'd have to memorise it for a start. Yes, yes. I mean, I invested an enormous amount of effort to make my recording at St Ignatius Loyola, in which I recorded almost all the music I'd written up to that point in 1995. And to have that all in my head and fingers uh, at one time was, I think, probably the biggest challenge I've ever faced, um, because it all had to be ready for recording in one go. Oh, well, my symphonic labyrinth takes 19 minutes alone. My variations take, I, I don't know, over over 10 minutes. So there's some big pieces there. They all had to be ready, ready to go on those three nights in New York. Do you think you're remarkable? Well, I think my memory's been remarkable and I hope that um, I'm remarkable as a composer. And those are the things that matter to me the composing really um and only time will tell david diddle thank you very much indeed my pleasure thank you well that's it for now as always please do subscribe or press the follow button because if you don't you might miss the next episode where not only do I get an advance preview of the new Harrison and Harrison organ at the Guards Chapel in London with Harrison's head voicer Andy Scott, but I also talk to Thomas Trotter about his life as an organist on the global stage. And just for good measure, I also meet the man who runs the National Pipe Organ Register. So until then, from me, Mark O'Brien, goodbye. <laughs>